Finally, as of the opening of Communicore Hall and Plaza, the Epcot overhaul has finished after a five-year period of construction, and I have to ask, was it worth it? Is the Epcot overhaul a proper revitalization of one of the best theme parks ever built, or is it a serious symptom of dysfunction and bad decisions constantly made at the executive level? Well, if I were a major shareholder, I would certainly like to know why it took Disney five years and millions of dollars to just essentially play with dirt in the middle of the park. Of course, there will be people who run to defend the company, stating that Disney had to pause construction because of the shutdown in 2020, but they'll immediately be countered by people pointing out that Universal actually did the opposite, using their empty park to accelerate construction on the Velocicoaster, which has been a massive hit for Islands of Adventure. Even with Universal briefly pausing construction on their new and widely ambitious park, Epic Universe, the progress there has since happened much faster than it took for Disney to do some very basic, and I must emphasize basic, landscaping in the middle of Epcot. The Epcot overhaul, which seemed pretty expensive and ambitious on announcement, is full of cancelled projects, and even the ones that did see it to completion have felt half-baked and very inappropriate for the theme of the park. In fact, a large goal of the Epcot overhaul was to erase the old, optimistic World's Fair theme, converting the park into a blank billboard for Disney brands and characters, yet another sign of dysfunction at the executive level, revealing their inability to carry on the Disney brand and name through interesting and unique park projects. I think about the recent renaming of Walt Disney Studios Park Paris to Disney Adventure World, a name purposefully chosen to be generic because of the aimless direction that the park is taking going forward, and I wonder, is Epcot now just another Disney Adventure World? Is it just some generic template on which to advertise Disney brands because incompetent leadership just cares so little about the parks, even though they're pretty much the largest and most consistent moneymaker for the company right now? Unfortunately, the hype around the Epcot overhaul has gone out with just a fizzle, with people glad to finally just have construction walls down after five years, but it's kind of astounding that more people aren't talking about what an absolute disaster this has been. Instead, I feel that this project should be seen as a much more serious failure, one that has been an absurd, irresponsible waste of money where the wrong decision was made in almost every single aspect. Did we already forget that the park introduced a fireworks show with infrastructure that cost an estimated $150 million, only to fail and have to be replaced because it was so poorly received? Epcot is in the worst state that it's ever been in, and now with the project finally officially finished, I think it's time to call it out as the financial and creative disaster that it is, because if I were a major shareholder, I would certainly be extremely concerned, wondering what about the company is so fundamentally broken that allowed this to even happen. To first understand how Epcot became the mess that it is today, we need to go back to its opening in 1982. In its first decade of operation, Epcot was spectacular and might just have been the greatest theme park ever built. It was extremely ambitious and innovative, not just because of the technology it showcased in its educational exhibits, but its actual ride and show design went far beyond what Disney had ever built before. Just the engineering behind Spaceship Earth is fascinating, and building so many expensive, unique, and creatively interesting rides in the first decade of the operation is just unheard of elsewhere. Epcot was not just technologically advanced for a theme park, but a large part of what made it so special was its meaning. Its attractions largely focused on history, but ended with inspirational messages about how we can shape the future, and World Showcase made a legitimate attempt to educate Americans about other countries and cultures, merging with the inspirational messages of Future World to celebrate the achievements and future of humanity. If you want an in-depth look at the incredible attractions of the first decade of Epcot, I've already covered them in a dedicated video that I'll link to, but Epcot quickly lost its way. When Michael Eisner became the CEO of Disney in 1984, one of the issues that he had to deal with was expanding the reach of Disney to a broader market. One way he attempted to do this was by appealing to teenagers, introducing Videopolis to Disneyland in 1985, which was sold as a teen-friendly dance club in the safety of the park. In his earliest years, Eisner drew from pop culture, introducing Captain EO, starring Michael Jackson the following year in 1986, 
which was followed by a version in Epcot a few months later. The trend continued with Star Tours in Disneyland in 1987, which also had a version that opened at Disney MGM Studios later in 1989. In addition to its massive pop culture appeal, Star Tours was innovative and thrilling, adapting motion simulator technology for pilots into a unique ride, one that was just the start of Eisner's pivot towards thrilling attractions, which were largely missing from the parks. Old Disney leadership did recognize this need with Space Mountain and Big Thunder Mountain, but Eisner introduced Splash Mountain to Disneyland in 1989, and from there included many other thrilling attractions in the parks going forward, which I do think was the right move for the most part. Where this went wrong though was Epcot, because while I think that the idea that the content of the park's rides was outdated is largely a myth, it was a lot of shows and slow moving experiences, and really would have benefited from more thrilling options to add a bit of variety. 1988's Maelstrom in the Norway Pavilion was actually considered a thrill ride because of its drop, and I really would have liked to have seen the Switzerland Pavilion, which would have included a version of the Matterhorn bobsleds unique to Epcot that was still thrilling, but added educational and cultural context. Beginning in 1994, Epcot's Future World was updated with a weird and colorful industrial postmodern aesthetic that, while I remember it fondly, was very much a strange fit for this area of the park. While the educational exhibits of Communicore were updated into Interventions, which really did come into its own a few years later, it did start off mostly as a showcase for Sega products, which I think fits the idea of being hip enough to appeal to older kids and teenagers. However, in the interest of including more pop culturally relevant or thrilling rides, the Universe of Energy was updated into Ellen's Energy Adventure in 1996, reusing the same ride system but updating to a comedic story about Ellen DeGeneres and Bill Nye as he takes her back in time to learn about fossil fuels among the dinosaurs. In 1998, Test Track replaced World of Motion, which while removing the broader look at the history of transportation, was still a masterpiece of Imagineering, bringing you through different tests of car production in such a uniquely thrilling way. 1999 saw a replacement in the Imagination Pavilion, introducing Journey into Your Imagination, which was supposed to tie into the Imagination Institute of Honey I Shrunk the Audience, so a light IP tie-in for pop culture relevancy. This ride was so hated because of what it replaced that it had to close after only a year, becoming the bizarre version that still exists today. It's also worth mentioning 2003's Mission Space, which replaced Horizons and is a high-intensity G4 simulator attempting to give you insight into what astronauts might experience on a mission to Mars. However, while Eisner's Epcot had many positive qualities, including the ever-changing interventions and the incredible Millennium Celebration that also introduced Illumination's Reflections of Earth, he was ousted from the company in 2005 after many notoriously poor decisions and was replaced by Bob Iger, who let Future World atrophy into a poor state, never updating the rides and allowing interventions to slowly close its exhibits, becoming a sad, empty shell of a project that once bustled with excited families and interesting exhibits. In fairness, Test Track was updated in 2012, but it was done through contractual obligation with General Motors, and the retheme was cheap, taking out all the fun elements for screens to convey that you were in a digital workshop. Anyways, the point is that while Epcot started off as an incredibly ambitious park, Meisner didn't see its value, and instead of meaningfully updating the existing attractions and expanding, he made many decisions that sent it into an identity crisis, becoming a relic of 90s pop culture. It did have merit as I really liked Test Track, Ellen's Energy Adventure, and even Mission Space, with many other positive elements to highlight, but I feel that the new direction aged the park much worse than just updating and maintaining what was already there. However, after enough time of Iger letting Epcot rot, with the exception of replacing Maelstrom with Frozen Ever After in 2016, Bob Chapek, who was the chairman of Parks and Resorts at the time, came out during the D23 Parks panel in 2017, announcing a complete overhaul to Epcot, promising a newer, brighter future that was more Disney. Before we get into what was announced for the Epcot overhaul, we need to take another step back into the Eisner era and discuss a massive cancel project for Epcot, one which became the foundation for the disaster that we've just witnessed today. In the late 90s or early aughts, big plans were conceived for something called Project Gemini, which according to ThemeParkTourist.com was mostly intended to overhaul Future World into something very different but much more thrilling. Renaming Future World to Discoveryland, 
the center of Communicore would have been converted into an elaborately landscaped forest full of rockwork and water features, also making a point to retain the Fountain of Nations. The two sides of Communicore would then be either demolished or reworked, adopting a more organic design to fit in with the new naturalistic theme. According to the article, one building would have had a BattleBots dinner show, and another an exhibit on the House of the Future, which did actually make its way into Interventions. The exterior of Spaceship Earth would have been replated to be gold in color, and the interior gutted for a roller coaster known as Time Racers, taking riders through dark ride scenes depicting the past, but blasting them out of the sides of the sphere at high speeds, racing around the circumference of the structure. The east side of Future World would then be converted into an area themed to Industry, which would have added another small utopia near Test Track, would have also included a reworking of the Wonders of Life, and surprisingly, Mission Space actually manifested out of this project. The west side of Future World would then take on the theme of Life, reworking the Living Seas into an educational attraction through the lens of the Little Mermaid, which unfortunately became the Seas with Nemo and Friends in 2007, removing any educational element. The Lands would get a flying theater, which explored various ecosystems, although Soarin' Over California was just cloned instead, which does kind of fit. Between the land and the seas, a suspended rainforest coaster would have glided through a jungle canopy, with the queue having messages and information on rainforest conservation, and between the land and Imagination Pavilion, there would have been a hedge maze, which I think is a strange fit, but I kind of understand its intention as a transition between the two themes. Do I think that Project Gemini was a good idea? Not really, because I'm not a fan of replacing the original Dark Rides, which were truly some of the best ever built, but I do understand the need to add thrill rides in the park, and at the very least, many of these projects were conceptually interesting. I should also mention that Ellen's Energy Adventure would have been replaced with an indoor roller coaster themed to energy through experiencing the Big Bang, and if you look at what's there today, you can definitely see how the idea was half-heartedly adapted, but with the Guardians of the Galaxy slapped onto it. In fact, it's clear that the current Epcot overhaul is very much based on Project Gemini, but removing the interesting ideas and thrills, instead using it as a launch point to vomit IP all over the park. The original Blue Sky idea for reworking Future World announced in 2017 is very clearly inspired by Discoveryland's organic buildings and emphasis on nature, and Journey of Water was reportedly another old idea, one that obviously was ruined because of the IP mandate, making the trail instead a Moana attraction. I think it's also important to note that in the Epcot presentations from D23 in both 2017 and 2019, there was a large emphasis on preserving the spirit of Epcot, which in retrospect is really just a huge lie. Now our work on the park is centered around a few guiding principles. We want to keep it true to the original vision, while making it more timeless, more relevant, more family, and more Disney. In fact, Chapek even brought out Tom Fitzgerald, an Imagineer who worked on Horizons among many other projects, who in turn spoke in a way to reassure the audience that the new overhaul would be guided by Epcot's original principles and creative direction. This was clearly not the case, as over the next few years, a slate of awful projects were announced for Epcot at both D23 2017 and 2019. If you watch through these presentations and read through the lines, it's clear that JPEG wanted to address the concerns of parents who complained that their kids found the park boring, and while it was very much in need of help, I do wonder, who was responsible for allowing it to even get to this point in the first place? If I recall, it was Iger who let Interventions slowly waste away, and refused to update any of the rides or pavilions, many of which were definitely appealing to younger children. Even in the Eisner era, while the direction was often misguided, it at least attempted to appeal to both younger kids and teenagers, while still preserving the theme and spirit of the park. This new direction for Epcot though, which many have blamed Chapek for, really is the vision of Bob Iger, a man who has a tendency to implement his own tasteless vanity projects, with the NBA experience at Disney Springs being a clear example of just how unfit his own passions are for the parks and experiences. Of course, Chapek is not without blame either, as I recall a piece of Disney promotional material emphasizing that Harmonious was his idea, but the bland, sterile Apple Store-esque design of the new Epcot was reportedly Iger's own idea, if rumors are true, and considering how he idolized Steve Jobs and fancy Disney as some weird tech company, the new Epcot does seem to line up with his tastes. So, this has been a lot of history and context leading up to the Epcot overhaul, which I think is important in understanding how and why it went so wrong. With this now in mind, let's actually take a look at what changes went into the overhaul.
While the Epcot overhaul has mostly been negative, I do want to be fair and point out positive elements when they exist. The first step of this project actually came to fruition in 2017, where only a month after D23, Mission Space was given meaningful investment, updating the intense orange mission to Mars with a new, more graphically impressive render. For the green mission, which previously just played the Mars mission without the G-Force simulation, a new concept was designed which takes you for a revolution around Earth, landing back in Florida while trying to avoid an outer band of a passing hurricane. It's not much, and a lot of people have unfortunately expressed that they find it boring, but I do find it interesting traveling over the planet, acting almost as a scavenger hunt where you try to identify different regions and cities across the world. It really is a well-made experience that can almost be thought of as adding another minor attraction into the park, so yeah, it's not popular, but I think that's more a symptom of the ride's reputation for intensity, and people not knowing that it was updated. However, the Epcot overhaul really began with the introduction of the Epcot Experience in October of 2019, reopening the former Odyssey restaurant as exhibit space to promote the park overhaul. Inside, there was a room with a model at the center, and as the surrounding screens changed the media to promote projects that had been announced over the past three years, projections would then play on the model. This was at a time when Disney's projection tech was still pretty exciting, and people didn't anticipate how overused it was about to become, so it was pretty interesting and novel for the time. In January of 2020, new shows premiered at the park, which included Canada Far and Wide in the Canada Pavilion, and Awesome Planet at the Land, both of which are decent but very forgettable, working as advertisements for Adventure by Disney and the Disney Conservation Fund, respectively. They're not great and failed to live up to the films shown in these venues in the past, but they aren't downright awful either. It's also worth mentioning that the China Pavilion was intended to get an updated film named Wondrous China, although nothing was ever heard of this past 2019. Unfortunately, Impressions to France was replaced with the Beauty and the Beast sing-along, which I don't need to tell you is awful, as even kids seemed bored the few times I've been in there. Although, by a miracle, it does appear that Impressions to France plays at the last hour of every day for a few showings, even though it's extremely inconvenient to see it. Work on the Epcot overhaul really got started in February of 2020 though, when construction walls went up around the center of Future World, and new, temporary paths were opened that made the park much more tedious to navigate. By this point in time, new concept art in 2019 showed that the buildings of Communicore East would still be standing, and quickly, demolition began on the western half of Epcot's core. However, work was abruptly halted when the world entered shutdown just a month later, and when Disney reopened its parks in July, the half-demolished building was still standing. Now, in fairness, I can understand why Disney would temporarily pause construction work, but take into account that as of right now, it has taken roughly five years for this particular element of the Epcot overhaul to be completed. It did roughly take another year for demolition to resume, and in the meantime, construction walls then went up around the entrance of the park, tearing down the Leave a Legacy structures. If you've watched my video on Epcot's Millennium Celebration, then you might recall that in 1999, the entrance to the park was decorated with granite structures that framed Spaceship Earth, which required tearing out some of the planters. For the price of $35 for one person, or $38 for two, you could get your picture taken and etched into a metal square, which would then be placed onto the granite as a matter of leaving your own legacy at the turn of the millennium. However, the last photos were added in 2007, and Disney is contractually obligated to keep these in place for 20 years, which they technically honored by erecting new walls just right outside of the turnstiles. They're different and a lot more colorful, and while I didn't mind the original granite structures, I did like that Disney was committing to actually restoring the original Epcot entrance. When finished in February of 2021, it reopened with restored planters and the crystal pylons of the original park having returned to the fountain. In addition to this, lighting was added to the area as well, which synced to the beacons of magic, LED lights placed between the panels of Spaceship Earth. Premiering in October of 2021 as part of Walt Disney World's 50th anniversary, this was actually one of the few elements that were not a disaster, and the lights will change in sync with music for occasional special segments for festivals or with the fireworks shows. So overall, while much of the park was under construction for an unreasonable amount of time, the new Epcot entrance was a strong positive development. Many of the ticket booths were painted in a rainbow of colors that might resonate better in a more imaginative or inspirational Epcot, but they work well with the new, greener entrance that returned the fountain to its former glory and a simple but impressive blessing of Spaceship Earth with the new lights.
Before we get into the negatives of the Epcot overhaul, I do want to mention one more positive. In September of 2021, Space 220 opens right next to Mission Space, which takes you up a space elevator for a unique dining experience. As you begin ascending, you can look up or down at screens that show your journey as the floor vibrates under your feet, simulating some degree of movement. Once you reach your destination, you're led out into a hallway where you can look into a rotating drum of vegetables being cultivated in space, which while not a huge element, does add to the overall theme, and in this era of Disney cutting corners at every opportunity, I'm surprised that this exists. Emerging out into the actual restaurant itself, most seats have a decent view outside of the station, which while achieved through a screen, is a really fun effect that allows you to view the Earth. Occasionally, spaceships or astronauts will move across the screen, which is a fun touch, and overall, the atmosphere of Space 220 is pretty agreeable. Like from what I've seen expressed by other people who have been here, I share the opinion that while the food was good, it's overpriced even by theme park standards, but I would still consider it to be a place that I'm interested in going back to. While it may lack the actual physical sets of the San Angel Inn, Blue Bayou, or the Beer Garden, it's still a restaurant that I think is worth trying at least once, because you're paying for the atmosphere, which is actually pretty strong. Weirdly, Space 220 does feel like a restaurant that might have premiered in the first decade of the park, and while its effects would have been achieved differently, probably with a real model of Earth outside the windows, it manages to feel like the only project of the Epcot overhaul that actually fits the spirit of the park. Just a month later, the first ride of the Epcot overhaul would open as Remy's Ratatouille Adventure, which is just kind of… fine, I suppose. The ride first premiered at Walt Disney Studios Park Paris in 2014, which at the time was really a standout, although I think that's mostly because the park is genuinely terrible and underbuilt, which I'll be more than fair and blame Eisner for. However, in Epcot, this is just a really expensive sea ticket, one that would be nice if it never exceeded a 20 minute wait, but often does actually have absurd wait times due to its lack of capacity and having no other rides anywhere near it. I imagine this is also because it has no height requirements either, so while it's not a bad ride, it definitely has much higher than expected weights because contemporary Disney is not capable of understanding how to meet the capacity needs of their parks. I should also mention that since it had to be built around the side of the France Pavilion, obviously the theming needed to extend towards the new courtyard, and if you take the time to look, you'll notice how much it clashes with the original architecture. The new French facades are very uniform and not very detailed compared to the rest of the pavilion, mostly lacking texture along the walls of the buildings, which is abrupt when you notice the transition. It's not necessarily bad on its own, and most people won't notice it, but it really does show a lack of care from leadership and imagineering, revealing their inability to be bothered to hold up the Disney standard that has been slipping from the company over the past few decades. While I've made it pretty clear how much I dislike inappropriate IP placement in the parks, I'm willing to give this one a pass because while the ride has nothing to do with France other than taking place in Paris, at least the original film does celebrate French culinary culture. If you removed Frozen, Moana, and the Guardians of the Galaxy, I would probably have a more positive opinion of this ride because the park wouldn't feel so oversaturated with Disney franchises. Speaking of the Guardians, Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewinds opened in May of 2022, and I have to say that, unfortunately, the theme really takes away from a great ride. People seem to get angry when I describe it as a space mountain with spinning and fun music, but at its core, that's the main appeal. You never hear people talk about how they love the Guardians, but rather about how fun the coaster is and what song they got when they rode. The queue itself is pretty, but generally uninteresting, and it's themed as an Epcot pavilion that showcases the planet of Xandar from the Marvel films, which is absurd and stupid. Creating a fake pavilion to educate you about a fictional Marvel planet does not at all fit the spirit of Epcot, and really, there's not much of interest happening in the queue anyways. While rides with pre-shows can sometimes be a bit tedious, in this case, I think this might be one of the worst to wait through, as it often feels cheap and painfully unfunny. The first room isn't particularly interesting, vaguely alluding to its origin as a Big Bang coaster, and explaining that you'll be teleported to a Zandarian ship to meet with people from the planet. Moving into the next room, you'll be teleported onto the ship which is achieved through retracting walls, but it's not particularly impressive knowing that it was achieved in 1998 with the Star Trek experience in Las Vegas, and just a year later on a much larger and more impressive scale with Poseidon's Fury in Islands of Adventure. It's fine in Guardians and is probably impressive to your average tourist, but it unfortunately leads to the scene where you encounter the Cosmic Generator, a MacGuffin that opens up wormholes for space travel. 
The generator disappears through a mirror trick, and the Guardians of the Galaxy show up on screen, really phoning in the worst performances I've ever seen in a pre-show. If people in the room haven't pushed the doors open by now and have left to go ride the coaster, then the show proceeds to introduce the Celestial, who is using the generator to open up a jump point back in time, cryptically stating that humanity was a mistake and that he needs to go back. Even the Imagineers who worked on the ride couldn't find justification for any of this being here, and it's clear that this ride only exists as an excuse to sell Marvel merchandise in the park, considering that Walt Disney World can't use any characters in its attractions that have already appeared at Marvel Superhero Island. From here, you enter the station and board the ride, which brings you alongside some screens where the Guardians remind you that you need to get the generator back. After a brief scene where you encounter the Celestial, you're launched through a jump point where the coaster enters the gravity building, and you spin around the track as indiscernible voices yell and keep encouraging you to keep up the great work. After a minute and a half of a really fun coaster layout, but an absolutely confused story with no real consequence to your experience anyways, you then enter a break run, encountering a projection where you're inducted into the Guardians of the Galaxy, even though you never actually helped or did anything. So, it's probably clear that my opinion of the ride is that it's completely unnecessary. It's really unfortunate to see the universe of energy gone, even though it really needed an update, and while Guardians is a fun coaster, it just has nothing to do with the park. While current Disney would obviously never do this, I can see a scenario where it fits into Epcot, either taking on its original Big Bang Energy theme, or another good idea in my opinion, taking inspiration from adventure through inner space. If you know nothing about that ride, it was an early Disneyland classic that shrunk you down to explore at the atomic level, but Cosmic Rewind seems like the perfect fit for adapting this theme. Instead of teleportation, you're shrunk into the atomic level, and instead of stars and planets, you're navigating electrons and spinning around the nucleus of an atom. It might not sound like the best idea without going into more depth, but I have to imagine that this coaster can fill that need for thrill rides in Epcot, while still maintaining an interesting and educational theme that fits the park. While the Epcot overhaul promised much more, it really didn't add much in the way of attractions, and even then, Guardians only replaced something that already had high capacity. However, in October of 2023, Journey of Water inspired by Moana opened, which is technically an attraction. It appears that Imagineers were able to sneak in a little edutainment here, as there are signs and thematic areas that follow the water cycle through this trail, but if we're being honest, it's just a really sophisticated splash pad themed to Moana, no doubt a directive from tasteless executives. Admittedly, many of the interactive water features are pretty fun and refreshing on a hot day, that is, when they're actually working. However, the problem here is obviously that the Moana theme is completely out of place with Epcot, has no real relation to the water cycle, and is just generally insulting and distasteful because it yet again reveals how executives view park goers as… kind of dumb. It's unfortunate because the interactive features of this attraction are legitimately cool, and while the jumping fountains at the Imagination Pavilion don't work well at all currently, they have proven popular with generations of children at this point. Because of this, I can very much imagine Journey of Water existing between the land and Imagination, dropping the IP, and instead bridging both pavilions thematically, which would still be just as popular, and leaning more into that educational value that Epcot should be providing. The current location is also bizarre because it's a tropical landscape in the middle of Future World, or I suppose the now labeled World Celebration. At the D23 presentation in 2019, Future World was split into three neighborhoods, which are obviously derived from Project Gemini. The industry section became World Discovery with a red theme, the middle of the park became World Celebration with a blue theme, and the nature section became World Nature, naturally adopting green. You can see these colors on the signs, trash cans, and food stands located around each respective area, although none are so distinct that most guests will even know that they exist. Generally, the neighborhood concept is confusing and pointless, only really existing to erase the idea that the front half of the park is about the future, because obviously the Guardians and Moana don't fit there. What's also strange about Journey of Water's tropical theme is just how it clashes with the new core of Epcot, which is known as Dreamer's Point, although I'll get to that in just a bit. Progress in removing the construction walls and renovating the core of the park has been slow, as Mouse Gear was converted into the generically labeled Creation Shop, which took three years to build, opening in September of 2021. 
From its reveal, I instantly knew that the remainder of World Celebration was not going to go well, because while Epcot Central Merchandise Shop has never been great, not even from the beginning, Creation Shop is just the absolute worst of modern minimalist trends. It has no theming, has nothing to do with Epcot, and is just literally a Disney merch department store with Mickey up on the walls. In 1998, a quirky but memorable experience opened as the highly themed Ice Station Cool and Future World. Taking you through an icy tunnel where you encountered a Neanderthal frozen in ice, and reaching for a refreshing Coca-Cola, it lets you out into an area where you could try Coke products from around the world, giving you insight into different regional tastes, which ironically did have some educational value to it. While the location moved into a less exciting space later as Club Cool, it also reopened right next to Creation Shop, and in the same way, all of the fun was sucked out of it, because Epcot is now just a big Apple store. Following this trend, Connections Cafe and Eatery, which is two separate institutions, a Starbucks and an actual quick service restaurant, opened in April of 2022. Again, the aesthetic is exactly what you would expect, and while the international mural along the ramp is interesting, it's really just lip service to a dead park that has no unifying theme any longer. You can also see this in Connections Cafe, where on the floor you'll find a map of Epcot, as in the city that Walt Disney wanted to build. It has nothing to do with the park as anything other than a meaningless reference to satisfy hardcore Epcot fans, and this level of shallow engagement by recycling old iconography is something that you'll find throughout the new overhaul. In the Guardian's queue, there's a small clip that might play where Peter Quill mentions some old Epcot attractions that he visited as a child, and Communicore Hall has some not-so-subtle references to some of these as well. The worst of this is located in Dreamer's Point though, which finally opened and allowed you to walk through the center of the park in December of 2023, after only five years of moving dirt around. In terms of references, the new center gardens are shaped like the original Epcot logo, which again is meaningless in this new version of the park, and worst of all, Disney leadership had the audacity to add a Walt Disney statue here. I think there's merit in adding him into other parks, as he obviously played a huge part in developing Disneyland, and all other castle parks are derived from the original. Even Buena Vista Street in California Adventure has a tasteful statue, as the area celebrates Los Angeles in the time he would have arrived, so his inclusion makes sense there, not as reverence, but as a fun nod to the era. However, Walt definitely wanted to build a city of the future that could potentially shape American society, and while I doubt it was feasible, it's hard to deny that his passion wasn't infectious. After his passing, the Imagineers created Epcot the Park as that inspirational permanent World's Fair, and while this iteration of the park was truly incredible, I have to imagine that Walt would have hated it, as it represented the death of his dream. I can also see Walt hating the company today, run by the uninspired corporate businessmen that he so despised and felt stifled creativity, transforming the once imaginative and inspirational Epcot into the cold, soulless billboard for Disney brands that it is today. Putting in a statue of Walt, overlooking the awful core of the park, which I'll get to in just a minute, is outright disgusting. It's as if the company has put a statue of him here as an endorsement of their new era of corporate greed, and considering what even the good version of Epcot represented, this is never a place that Walt ever belonged. Perhaps you might recall, but in the early concept art, the original framing of the statue looked as if Walt was sitting on a toilet, which I thought was appropriate symbolism for how he would view the park and the company executives today. There's a lot of things that are out of line under Iger, but this one might just be the worst. So, actually talking about the new core of World Celebration, what's actually wrong with it other than the Walt statue? Well, the original Project Gemini plans were much more ambitious, probably like a much more lush version of Journey of Water, and even in the 2017 concept art, the new core appeared like a serious overhaul. While it hinted at this in the art though, updated renderings in 2019 revealed this strange elevated garden building on legs that was referred to as the Festival Center. You might recall that I've criticized this building before, because it appears to have an area for fake Epcot news anchors, which I believe is probably another one of Iger's own interests that has no place in the parks. If you were not aware, Iger started his career as a weatherman and failed to become a news anchor before eventually shifting over to ABC, 
but I have a suspicion that this festival center concept art has ties to that. The building itself also has a garden on the roof, one which would have likely allowed for upcharge events and dessert party fireworks viewing. However, the World Celebration Gardens have many other strange features, such as this wishing tree, which no one ever explained what it was intended to be, and a small fountain that celebrated Disney storytelling, whatever that's supposed to mean. Later, a few other bizarre garden features were sometimes talked about as well, all of which were just inherently stupid. Later, after Iger left the company and Chapek briefly became CEO, he reportedly realized how unfeasible the festival center was, instead opting to actually partially rebuild what they had just demolished and announcing Communicore Hall. Another reported rumor is that Iger didn't want to bother renovating Innoventions West, which resulted in the garden building, so not only did the company spend money on demolishing perfectly good infrastructure, but it was Chapek who had to realize that it needed to be rebuilt if the park was going to get additional festival space, or at least that's how I heard the story. Anyways, while the original garden plans were just incredibly pretentious and stupid, Chapek had to make cuts, and when he was ousted suddenly in November of 2022, and Iger was immediately whisked right back in, it appears to have caused even more chaos. When the gardens finally opened six months ago, it was clear that a new, hastily slapped together plan was put in place just to get it done. You know that this is an Iger plan because it's literally an outdoor Apple store with grey and tan furniture, and chargers for your phone. A lot of people have said that they really like this space as they enjoy the greenery, but I also very much disagree. There was nothing wrong at all with the old Epcot core with its brilliant fountain of nations, and while it's true that it was a lot of concrete as areas of grass and palm trees were paved over when it was transformed under Eisner, this area was still a vibe. It was really cool, feeling like you were standing in the 1939 New York World's Fair, which was a huge inspiration for Epcot, and if Iger really wanted more greenery, all he had to do was restore some of those flower beds and water features. A big goal for the new Epcot core was additional shade, which was obviously a lie, because Disney ripped out air-conditioned buildings and a nice breezeway, and even when it premiered, many people were defending this, saying that it'll be really nice when the trees grow their leaves back, because, well, this area opened in winter and felt pretty dead. From the start, I knew that this wouldn't be the case, because if anyone had bothered to notice, Epcot is located in Florida, where shade does not offer any relief from the heat whatsoever. I can confirm that as I gathered footage for this video, walking around in 95 degree weather with a heat index of 104, that this area is absolutely miserable and feels like walking on hot concrete, because that's exactly what you're doing. Even the fountains didn't make it into this final product, with a concrete planter sitting in the middle instead. I should also mention that this area is literally borrowing features from Silicon Valley corporate parks, with these strange, rusty decorations scattered around, and going back to a point I made earlier, the style of these temperate plants and trees clashes with the tropical vegetation of Journey of Water where they meet. In fact, I very much prefer the grassy lawns, flower beds, and palm trees that juxtapose the unique architecture of old Communicore, and none of what you see now is an improvement at all. I'll never say that landscaping is ever really bad, but it's clear that this was all thrown together last minute because of self-inflicted financial chaos, and it absolutely does not live up to the green spaces that were here previously. The area also has lights that sync with the LEDs on Spaceship Earth, and many have noted that the ones incorporated into the pavement were broken from day one. I actually managed to come across someone who claimed to be a contractor who worked on this, who essentially stated that Disney rushed to get this done, and so the quality of the work is naturally pretty shoddy, which is still why these lights don't really work six months later. I have no way of verifying if this person was telling the truth, but it certainly tracks with how the rest of the gardens have turned out. So yes, landscaping is nice, but it's insane to think that any of this is an improvement on what came before, and even if you enjoy the greenery, you should really be expecting a lot more out of Disney. I should also remind you that this took an entire five years, where I have to reiterate, the company spent millions of dollars to play with dirt, and the end result was some soulless corporate park that was rushed to completion. Am I insane, or is this not an alarming sign of extreme dysfunction within the company? Adjacent to the gardens is Communicore Hall and Plaza, which now just finally opened six months after the rest of Dreamers Point was rushed for holiday crowds. This new, small building contains the Mickey and Friends meet and greet, having you wait in an outdoor queue with an interesting print along the walls. It appears to be a colorful celebration of old Epcot attractions, conveniently reminding you that everything used to be so much better. Moving along the outside of the building to the plaza, you'll see a stand labeled Festival Favorites, 
serving your favorite cafeteria food that has traditionally sold well at the Epcot festivals. Nearby is a stage which will host performances for seasonal events, and out in the plaza is concrete and astroturf, with tiny umbrellas to shade you from the oppressive heat that is now trapped in this area of the park. If you would like some relief, Communicore Hall is a small, air-conditioned hallway that was apparently planned as flexible space for future festivals, although at this moment it's just a seating area, serving the same exact purpose as the old building that was abandoned and demolished, but now at the cost of millions of dollars five years later. Communicore Hall and Plaza is also an incredibly strange name for this complex, as actual Communicore was an extensive series of educational exhibits that emphasized new technology and the power of communication. This new, thrown-together festival space just recycles the name, and borrows triangles from Spaceship Earth on its exterior, only reinforcing my point that this new vision of Epcot likes to randomly reference old iconography without understanding why it might be interesting or important. To wrap up the new core of Epcot, though, I do want to also briefly mention that it has a new score composed by Panar Toprak. Nothing against her as a composer, but this new score plays about the entrance of Epcot, as well as around all of the neighborhoods, and in my opinion, is very tonally wrong for what the park should be. The previous loop that played at the entrance musically represented the attractions of Future World, which were all strong and varied orchestral pieces that felt grand and epic. Moving into the park itself, it was defined by a playlist of New Age music that was imaginative and playful, simultaneously relaxed yet curious, fitting the colorful, postmodern aesthetic of Innoventions. However, the new score feels pretentious and overly sentimental. Long gone is the fun and excitement, replaced by the same le motif that quickly becomes annoying, as it literally plays everywhere until you get into World Showcase. If you ask executives what the theme of Epcot is, they would probably answer with, the magic of possibility, a corporate buzz phrase that has been used to justify this new direction for the park, trying to explain its generic template for Disney brands as something inspirational. Obviously, this falls flat as the new core of Epcot is more about Instagrammable moments and superficial callbacks to Epcot iconography than actual inspiration. Unfortunately, Toprak's new Epcot anthem only emphasizes this decline, reminding me quite a bit of something you would hear in a soulless corporate training video that is attempting to appear important and inspirational, yet is clearly disingenuous. Like I said, this plays everywhere to the point of becoming annoying because it's so pretentious and repetitive, and I would even go so far as to consider it depressing, representing a dead husk of a once great park. So, while some aspects of the Epcot overhaul have been positive, as with Space 220, it has generally ranged from okay but wrong for the park, to just downright embarrassing for the company. Speaking of embarrassing though, I still haven't really mentioned Harmonious, which opened in October of 2021 as part of the Walt Disney World 50th anniversary, and as I mentioned way earlier in the intro of the video, it was a pretty significant failure. You've certainly heard my problems with intellectual property making its way into the park, and Harmonious was literally a Disney greatest hit show that took music from non-Eurocentric Disney animated films and had vocalists sing the lyrics in another language. For example, China was represented with Reflection from Mulan, or Mexico had Remember Me from Coco. What's wild is that for Africa, the show played songs from The Lion King, which, if I recall correctly, is just Shakespeare's Hamlets but with animals. So is this really the decision we're going for for paying lip service to other cultures? Is the India segment really represented by the Jungle Book, which, in the source material, many academics have pointed out alludes to the legitimization of British imperialism over India? While I really do wish that the show failed because it was literally just Disney songs thrown together, the primary reason that it lost so much money for the park was because of its massive infrastructure. Unlike the previous permanent show, Illuminations, which had its infrastructure hidden backstage and would come out to the lagoon daily, the barges for Harmonious were permanent, met with many complaints from park guests who felt that they ruined the view of World Showcase. Disney assured people that these would have fountains on during the day, which would hide the steel, but even when this rarely worked, it still looked terrible. Worse though, is that the giant ring made it clear that the show was only really viewable from the north or south, with the north viewing area roped off for upcharged dessert parties, and the south obstructed by the American Gardens Theater. 
The structures weren't just an eyesore, but people were deciding to leave the park at night because it was clear that they wouldn't even be able to watch the show as intended anyways. Reportedly, Disney was pressured by restaurant operators to rework the show because they were losing so much money at the end of the night, as no one was really staying at World Showcase. So, an estimated $150 million later, it closed in April of 2023 and was dismantled, replaced by Luminous, The Symphony of Us, in December of 2023. Disney seemed to learn a few lessons here, as the infrastructure was not permanent but sails out daily, and while Harmonies had fireworks, it was very much a fountain show to save on pyro costs. Luminous does have a stronger fireworks presence, which I think is also a lot more appealing to park guests, and they'll probably remember the heart-shaped mortars, but I'm not so lizard-brained and easily impressed by flashing lights. Illuminations was unbeatable, truly the best fireworks show ever produced, not just because it was ambitious even after its 20-year run, but because it had an incredible original score with profound themes about world unity, truly a perfect fit for Epcot, and probably Eisner's best project for the park. Luminous, while it does have an original score, still incorporates a lot of Disney film music, and while it does recontextualize the lyrics into a show theme of coming together, it still falls short because Iger really doesn't understand that beating you over the head with Disney IP isn't interesting in Epcot. Toy Story is a film that very much reflects suburban American culture of the mid-90s, so when I hear, you've got a friend in me in the middle of Epcot, I'm just thinking about Pizza Planet or Sid blowing up Combat Carl and not taking the show seriously. Even if you enjoy the music and the fireworks, consensus also seems to agree that the show has its stronger moments, but it's just generally slow paced and kind of dull. It's an improvement over Harmonious for sure, but again, not a fireworks show that reaches the Disney standard. At this point in the video, I feel like I've covered an immense amount of information, but even then, I still haven't discussed the many cancelled projects of the Epcot overhaul, which to me, only reinforces what a mess this has been. Obviously, I've spoken about the original reworking of Epcot's core, which in my opinion was already overly pretentious and had many outright stupid elements, corrupting the lush gardens of Project Gemini. Another facet of that project was the reworking of the Wonders of Life, and while there doesn't seem to be information on what this would have looked like, the idea of reviving the pavilion came back with the Epcot overhaul. However, this plan was to turn the abandoned building into the Play Pavilion, a thinly veiled excuse for an actual IP pavilion, where you would enter a digital city full of interactive activities for kids and various character meet and greets. Oh, if only there were buildings in the middle of the park designed for exactly this purpose! Now, of course, the Play Pavilion didn't really have much to do with Epcot either, literally adopting an emoji aesthetic that I believe was probably supposed to have something to do with Ralph Breaks the Internet and getting kids hooked on Disney Brand Synergy Online, or something. Exterior work even occurred on this structure, with this rumored to have been a resealing of the dome due to issues with water leaks, but the pavilion was likely cancelled because it had little direct return on investment, and concerning the events of 2020, the idea of interactive high-touch areas seemed like a bad idea for the time. Another cancelled project was a significant refurbishment of Spaceship Earth, which since its opening has been a problematic ride because of how much stress going up and down taxes and strains the mechanical system. Unfortunately, Chapek announced that he was essentially going to ruin the attraction, putting in the story light, achieved through LEDs and projections to change the focus of the ride to the history of storytelling which will obviously tie into Disney IP somehow. A lot of people have said that no, this wasn't going to be the case, but concept art literally shows Moana's grandmother flying around a new Polynesian scene. This was thankfully cancelled, managing to save an Epcot classic, at least for the time being, but rumor is that the ride still really needs major infrastructure upgrades, and so a major refurbishment is still apparently a possibility. Finally, you might recall Disney announcing a Mary Poppins attraction in Cherry Tree Lane for the UK Pavilion, which in my opinion would have also been a waste of money. Eventually, leaks confirmed that this would have been an indoor teacups ride, but it was rumored to have been cancelled by Chapek because of its cost and the underwhelming box office of Mary Poppins Returns, which the ride was rumored to have been more heavily based upon. So that has been the Epcot overhaul, which set out to fix the aging mistakes of the Eisner era, but ended up doing far more damage to the brand of the park 
that will cost a lot of money to fix down the line. This long five-year project has definitely had some positive elements like the new entrance or the premiere of Space 220, but for the most part it has either been IP rides that will age the park quickly or has been a series of expensive disasters that have wasted a lot of time and money, raising serious concerns about the ability of Disney leadership to handle this and other future projects. Remember how this was supposed to be more timeless, more relevant, and more Disney? Was that accomplished here? It's so bizarre to me that people aren't reflecting on how awful this has been, and while I understand why someone would be relieved to finally have construction walls down after five years, I produced this video to remind everyone just how irresponsible and wasteful the actions of company leadership has been through this whole process. I've now spent a substantial amount of time talking about the upcut overhaul, but if we actually step back, it also actually didn't seem like much was accomplished. After five years, the park received three attractions with Journey of Water, Ratatouille, and Guardians, which itself was just replacing another ride. The new core of the park is a concrete heat trap, which is ironic because that's what people complained about previously, and the renovated Creation Shop and Connections Eatery are like walking into a department store in Chipotle respectively. Those things can be good on their own, but certainly not in a Disney theme park, which if I recall correctly, people travel to because they expect unique themed experiences that they can't find at their local suburban mall. It's also crazy to me that Interventions West was demolished for a vanity project that only resulted in Chapek saying, whoopsie, and sort of half rebuilding what was there before for what I assume is an absurd and wasteful sum of money. The overhaul, despite the lies, rarely ever honored the original design or themes of Epcot, and while yes, there was imagery placed around the park, it was never done in a meaningful way other than just as superficial references that can actually come off as disrespectful. Chapek and others at D23 spent a lot of time assuring audiences that this new Epcot would fit the original vision, and even emphasized additional shade in the center, which in practice miraculously managed to actually make things hotter. The only promise that Disney actually delivered on was making the park more interesting for real young kids by building Remy's Ratatouille Adventure and an interactive water trail, but are these really actually that substantial? I think back to all the interactive exhibits of Interventions that as a kid, I could spend an entire day wandering, but I have to ask, is what's here now better than before? After five years and millions wasted, the answer is no, it really isn't. I can get behind Mission Space's new green mission and Space 220, but even Guardians, which does admittedly have a really fantastic track layout, just feels so out of place, which really detracts from what could have been a world-class experience. The Epcot overhaul was intended to revive the park, fix the mistakes of Eisner, and yet managed to make it all just so much worse. That's why I really don't understand people who currently love this park, as knowing what came before, Epcot now appears as a dead husk of what was once the greatest theme park ever built, a place that once inspired you to want a new, brighter future. Eisner's later Epcot, which admittedly made many mistakes and aged the park, was still an exciting and beautiful place that understood the theme. Still, it was Iger who let it rot for 15 years, and once plans for renovation commenced, we watched this expensive disaster unfold slowly over the past five years, canceling many projects that were admittedly never great, and mismanaging money to a wildly irresponsible degree, and all of this to only accentuate the issues rather than fixing them. Even with all the so-called investment, certain areas of the park are still feeling old, broken, and abandoned, and coming back to the original question posed at the beginning of the video, I have to ask, was it worth it? No, of course not. As always, if you enjoy videos like these, you can do me a favor by leaving a like to help it gain more exposure, and if you haven't yet subscribed and hit the bell notification yet either, you can do so now to be alerted to new videos as they release.